Okay. Yeah, good. What is it? I guess it's good afternoon now, isn't it? It's uh, now, now noon. Uh, I am uh, Mark Bradley, the Director of the Information Security Oversight Office uh, here at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're what I like to call the uh, dark side of the archives. We do the classified work here, so ergo why I'm here and also because I'm a lifelong friend of, uh, of uh, our speaker today. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to the uh, William G. McGowan Theater. Uh, whether you are here in the theater or watching on YouTube, uh, we're glad you could join us for today's uh, discussion of the new book, Writer, Sailor, Soldier, Spy, Ernest Hemingway's Secret Adventures from 1935 to 1961 with author Nicholas Reynolds. Before we get started, I want to tell you about uh, two other programs that are coming uh, very soon to the McGowan. On Thursday, September 7th at noon, we'll screen the film American Experience, a class apart, which was built around the landmark 1954 legal case, Hernandez versus Texas. The hour-long uh, film interweaves the stories of its central characters with a broader story of the civil rights movement. It also brings to life the heroic post-World War II struggle of Mexican-Americans fighting to dismantle the discrimination uh, targeted against them. This program is presented in conjunction with uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. On Tuesday, September 12th at noon, uh, journalist Mark Bowden will be here to discuss his book, Way, 1968, a turning point of the American war in Vietnam. In January 1968, the fighting in Vietnam uh, was at a stalemate. In his book, Bowden discusses the Tet Offensive and how the North Vietnamese planned to win the war in a single stroke with military actions and popular uprisings across South Vietnam. But the most crucial part of the plan was the capture of Way, uh, that country's cultural capital. Uh, Mark, as you know, is, is an excellent writer and speaker, so I would encourage you to, uh, to come to that if you can. His talk uh, will mark the first in a series of public discussions, book lectures, and other events to be presented in conjunction with the upcoming exhibit, Remembering Vietnam, which opens in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery on November 10th, which is, uh, the, I guess, the day we're celebrating Labor yeah. Veterans Day this day. To learn about these and all our public programs and exhibits, Please consult our calendar, uh, monthly calendar of events online at archives.gov. Uh, Printed copies are available also out in the, uh, the lobby. Another way to get more uh, involved with the archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports the work of the agency, especially its education and outreach programs. Pick up your application for membership in the lobby or become a member online at archivesfoundation.org. All right, turning to today. Uh, military and intelligence expert and historian Nicholas Reynolds shares a riveting international cloak and dagger epic. It's a stunning untold story of Nobel Prize winning novelist Ernest Hemingway's dangerous secret life, including his role as a Soviet agent codenamed Argo that fueled his art and ultimately his undoing. In 2010, while well, he was an historian at the uh, CIA's museum, I guess, does that make the best museum no one's ever, ever visited? Uh, <laughs> Nicholas Reynolds began to uncover clues suggesting Hemingway was deeply involved in the mid-20th century uh, spycraft, a mysterious and shocking relationship that was far more complex, sustained, and fraught with risks than ever been previously supposed. Now, Reynolds' meticulously researched and captivating narrative, writer, sailor, soldier, spy, reveals for the first time the whole story of this hidden side of Hemingway's life. His troubling recruitment by Soviet spies to work with the NKVD, the forerunner to the KGB and the SVR, followed in short order by a complex set of secret relationships with American intelligence services. Reviewing Nick's book, Bob Hoover and the Minneapolis Star Tribune writes, quote, an engrossing read for Hemingway buffs as well as casual readers. Writer, sailor, soldier, spy adds more fascinating details to a life that remains continually fascinating. John Earl Haynes, who used to be a historian at the Library of Congress, uh, now retired, co-author of Spies, The Rise and Fall of the KGB in America, calls Nick's book a thorough, well-researched, and highly readable account of Ernest Hemingway's engagement with espionage, American and Soviet, communism, and military adventurism. And contributing editor Gregory McNamee writes in the Kirkus Review, an engrossing story of Hemingway's disillusionment with American politics, his sympathy with communism, his attraction to adventure and subversion. 
In the acknowledgment section of his book, Nick thanks staff members at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. and College Park, as well as the Franklin D. Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy Presidential Libraries. He specifically recognizes several staff members at the Kennedy Library, which houses the Ernest Hemingway Collection, for their capable assistance to tell this fascinating story. Now, a bit about Nick, whom I've known now for 37 years. Uh, Nicholas Reynolds has worked in the fields of modern military history and intelligence off and on for 40 years, with some unusual detours. With a freshly minted DPhil from Oxford University in the UK, he joined the Marine Corps in 1970s, serving as an infantry officer and then as an historian. As a colonel in the reserves, he eventually became officer in charge of field history, deploying historians around the world to capture history as it was being made. When not on duty with the United States Marine Corps, he served as a CIA, CIA officer, uh, most recently as an historian for the CIA Museum. He also uh, tried his hand at farming, writing a novel, and mountain climbing. One of his proudest moments was making it to the glaciated peak of Mount Baker at the age of 64. He currently teaches as an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University, and with his wife Becky, cares for rescue pugs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me and, and welcome, please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, uh, Nicholas Reynolds. So uh, thank you so much, Mark, for the kind remarks and for 37 years of friendship, but uh, who's counting, right? Another, another 37, I hope. Uh, so what, what I would like to do is talk about how I came to write the book, and then I'll take you through some of Hemingway's adventures and then uh, take questions. So I'm not going to... I'm not going to give away the whole plot of the book, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you some background and uh, some of the context. So uh, as Mark indicated, it starts, the, this story starts with me not planning to write a book. Okay. I was doing something else. I was working at the CIA library and the CIA um, museum, and we were putting together an, uh, an exhibit on World War II which uh, was going to be about kind of the origins of American central intelligence, lowercase, uh, initially. So uh, in, during World War II, as, as most of you probably know, uh, there was an organization called OSS, uh, the or uh, Office of Strategic Services, and that was the forerunner of CIA. So it was a, it was a pickup team, it was a wartime pickup team, uh, considering, uh, considering the U.S. basically started from nothing, they did a pretty good job. Um, there was there was really no American, uh, there was no standalone American intelligence agency before uh, OSS stepped into the breach. So um, what I was trying to do was um, come up with a little background on the OSS and uh, some context that we could use to write a, a, a museum pub and to put up this exhibit. So a little bit of planning, uh, a little bit of writing about content. And one of the ways I did this was to look at who was in OSS. And I had a dim memory that, uh, from my childhood of reading a great book called Is Paris Burning? Um, Collins and Lapierre. And that was what Hitler called to ask his commander in Paris uh, when the Germans were uh, about to evacuate Paris. And uh, the answer uh, was no. Um, and uh, Hemingway was involved in this. I remember that Hemingway was involved in this. So um, I thought, well, I wonder if there's a Hemingway connection with OSS that's strong enough to uh, appear in this, in, this, um, in this exhibit. So I um, researched the Hemingways. I went out, went out to College Park and uh, where the OSS records are, and I, I searched on Hemingway. And I came up not just with Ernest, but his brother Lester and his son Jack. So um, this was a, I'm, this this is kind of like a precursor drug, you know. This is like you um, you, you you start getting hooked uh, on on the hard stuff by taking too much uh, low dose aspirin. So um, anyway, um, the uh, I thought this was remarkable. 130 million people in the United States, more or less. Uh, never more than 13,000 people in OSS on any given day. And here's the three, here's the three uh, military age uh, 
Hemingway brothers actually, Ernest was, was kind of, a, a, he was actually too old for World War II, but nobody told him. Uh, so um, he, uh, so, and, and, and they found their way to OSS individually. It wasn't, it wasn't like, hey, I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying for, o trying out for OSS, why don't you try out too? Uh, no, uh, Lester, Ernest, and, uh, and Jack found their way separately to OSS. So that was a, that was a, a, a uh, marker on the, on my road to writing this book. And what eventually happened was, uh, I started to do research more for myself than for the museum. I did, I did what the museum wanted me to. I did, did my work for the exhibit, but then I continued doing this research on my own. And uh, so another really significant marker uh, on this road um, was when I went down to uh, the CIA library, which actually is kind of like any library in the world, um, except it's with, on the CIA property. So. Um, it's got books, it's got librarians, the books are, if there are classified books, I don't know uh, where they are. Uh, uh, all of the, you know, it's, it's books, it's, it's, a, it's a reference library, basically. So, um, and I, so I, I've looked at all the likely places for information on Hemingway in World War II, uh, Hemingway's relationship with American intelligence. And so now I start looking on, in slightly less likely places. And one of the books I pulled off the shelf was a book called Spies uh, by uh, Haynes, Claire, and Vasiliev, uh, published by Yale University Press in 2009. And this was about Soviet espionage in the United States from 1933 um, pretty much to 1945 when they lost their initiative. So um, I, my, I use a really sophisticated research technique of going to the index and uh, looking under H. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm used to finding um, a one or two references to Hemingway. And Hemingway is usually used in books like that as a, uh, you know, to supply context for the book. So as in, this is, a, you know, in the year that Hemingway published For Whom the Bell Tolls, this and that happened in the, in the world of intelligence or politics. But this was the other way around. So there was a, a chapter on, uh, or subchapter on Hemingway about, 10 or 12 pages, and uh, it included verbatim quotes from his file, uh, <clears throat> from his Soviet file, and uh, in that file it states that in late 1940 or early 1941, he was recruited for our work for ideological reasons. So uh, now I really was hooked. Um, this, was, this was beyond, a, so now, it, now I've really got to feed the habit um, I was, still wasn't intending to write a book. I thought I'd write an article or two, uh, and that would be it. Uh, and that led me on kind of a six-year quest, uh, archives, um, both coasts, uh, England, um, parts of the, the Soviet, ar there are Soviet archives here in the Library of Congress, uh, which contain these, the, the, the crucial papers. So ultimately, I wind up writing a book on Hemingway and espionage and take that piece, that, that key sentence there uh, his, that speaks to his recruitment by the Soviets and put it in context and, and explain what it does, uh, you know, how does it fit into the rest of Hemingway's life and um, what does it mean for Hemingway scholarship, uh, how, how should we think of Hemingway now in light of um, that, that fact. Uh, so that's basically what the book's about. And I'll be happy to go in more detail um, in the question and answer. But right now, I'd like to take you on a little, a little trip through. Um, these, are the, these are some of the uh, milestones I cover in the book and uh, some of the uh, individuals that we meet along the way. So um, the book starts in 1935. Uh, and at that point, Hemingway lives in Key West in this lovely house, which is still standing. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it has survived multiple hurricanes and will survive the next one as well. Uh, it's built out of very solid stone and uh, sits on a piece of high ground to the extent that there is high ground in Key West. Um, and that's where he was living in uh, 1935 as a hurricane approached. And uh, that hurricane uh, swept by uh, 
um, Key West, didn't do much to Key West, but it did strike higher up in the Keys, uh, and it, uh, the result was the death of hundreds of um, veterans who were there uh, on basically working on release. They were building an overseas highway uh, from um, the mainland to Key West. In those days, you couldn't, you couldn't drive the whole way, so you, could, you, drive, you drove part way, and then you took the ferry, you flew, or uh, you took the train uh, up until this hurricane uh, washed, the, washed the tracks away. So uh, Hemingway went up there, and he was uh, outraged by what he saw, uh, and he blamed the U.S. government. Uh, he was pretty much apolitical before this time, uh, but this is kind of his, his uh, this is his wake-up call. This is when he starts to get involved in politics, and he starts by criticizing the American establishment very bitterly. Okay, so about the same time, one of the themes of this story, uh, or, or any Hemingway story, is what a lot of living this guy did. Um, <laughs> Hemingway had more adventures in his 60, almost 61 years than, um, you know, most of us in this room combined. And uh, he's already, by at, when the story starts, uh, he's already been married twice, okay? This is number three. Uh, this is Martha Gellhorn. Uh, I kind of like this picture, which, I, which is not, um, I, I don't think you'll see this in, in other books. Uh, and I found it at the, in the archives in, uh, in, um, in Boston. And the crease leads me to think, these are, these are Hemingway's family photos. The crease leads me to think that maybe this photo was in Ernest's wallet for a few years. I think it's kind of a fetching picture. Um, beautiful young lady, 10 years younger than Ernest, uh, literally walks into his bar in uh, Key West and um, befriends him and eventually becomes his wife. She's a, an enabler of this story. I'm, I don't mean to say that she was a Soviet agent in any way, but she enables him to open up to the left politically and to uh, absorb a whole new set of experience. And that experience is the Spanish Civil War. So uh, again, here's a, here, here's a guy who's got just so much adventure going on in his life. Here he is with the New York Times guy, uh, Herbert L. Matthews. And uh, they're in a building that has been shelled, maybe the Hotel Florida, I don't know for sure. And it looks like Ernest is holding a shell, OK? Again, way more um, something I don't do on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of get a kick out of this for, for, by, for a couple of reasons. One is to make that point. Um, the other is Herbert L. Matthews um, is going to reappear in this story later on. And uh, this is a guy who wears a coat and tie all the time. They're at war. They're in a war zone. They, they you know, wh what do they do on a daily basis? They get in a car, they drive to the front, uh, they take pictures, they interview people. Uh, Matthews is, is wearing, in this case, a three-piece suit. Um, you know, different, different times, I think. Um, okay, who does, so, so not only does he meet interesting people like Matthews and participate in the war, but he meets some pretty bad guys, too. Uh, that set the stage for what, what's going to happen later on in his life. And this is one of them. This is a guy named Alexander Orlov, who called himself Alexander Orlov. He had multiple names. And he is the NKVD, um, that's Soviet intelligence. Uh, and in those days, that's the name it went by. And he is the NKVD chief of station from 1936 to 1938 in, um, in Spain. And he is a very accomplished spy. Uh, spoke a number of languages, uh, an expert in guerrilla warfare, and uh, he befriends Ernest. They, they drink together a couple times. Uh, he shows Ernest the training camp for, uh, for communist guerrillas. And he may have facilitated Ernest's visit to the guerrilla camp uh, that it, uh, where, where he spent four days and uh, that is the experience that's at the heart that drives the plot of For Whom the Bell Tolls. Anyway, Alexander Orlov, uh, that's, one of, that's probably his first brush with um, Soviet intelligence, the really hardcore part. Okay, uh, the Soviets, it's a, they're a bad penny. Soviet intelligence 
uh, just doesn't seem to go away from Ernest's life, or at least not really fast. This is a man named um, Golos, Jacob Golos, who lives in New York City, and he's one of the linchpins of Soviet intelligence in the United States. So he's the facilitator. Uh, he's, for many cases, many American cases, and there were hundreds of American cases. For many American cases, he's the developer and the recruiter. Uh, he plays a role in the Manhattan Project, uh, and he runs a lot of cases here in Washington, um, out of New York, and uh, you know, the, the, the poor OSS. Uh, OSS has 18, count them, 18 Soviet penetrations. And a lot of them are run by this guy. And he is the man who, uh, who pitches Ernest. He's five foot two, uh, those are blue eyes, he's got red hair. Uh, he's pretty well dressed in this picture, but usually it's kind of shabby. He is the, his, his lifelong profession is revolutionary. He is uh, kind of a true believer in uh, communist utopia, and that's what he dedicates his life to. He also likes the ladies, but if he had to choose between the ladies and revolution, he would pick revolution. So um, Jacob Golos, uh, another important person in our story. Okay, how do we know what I'm telling you about Hemingway and espionage? So um, these are transcripts of uh, Soviet documents uh, Soviet intelligence files made by a gentleman named Vasiliev, who's one of the authors of Spies. And this you can find in the Library of Congress. Um, I, if folks are interested, I can get into the details in, in the question and answer. But basically, uh, this is a pretty typical intelligence file, uh, and it, it details things that happened in the Hemingway case. Uh, that word up there is Hemingway, and I'll show you the English translation, so you can see um, a little bit of, of operational detail from this case. Anyway, so I, I think it's, I think th these documents are solid. Um, I think they, there's a remarkable story behind them, and uh, I think it's almost a matter of fact that Hemingway, there's, you know, the, you, you, could, you could take a, it would be perfect if you could go to Moscow and order the original documents in the SVR uh, reading room. But that doesn't happen. In fact, the only country that really lets you look at intelligence documents is this one. Uh, so um, I think we should count our blessings. And you know, there may be times when you're frustrated with CIA or FBI or whatever. But um, compared to the rest of the world, uh, the US intelligence agencies are remarkably open. Anyway, you cannot go see this in Moscow, alas. If you could, then it would be an even, there would be an even stronger case. Um, and you could see the rest of Hemingway's file. We only see about 12 pages. All right, so more, more adventure. Um, more back to the theme of, of this is a guy who gets around. Uh, and he goes, after, after he gets married to Gellhorn. Uh, so Gellhorn, he and Gellhorn go to Spain together. Uh, he moves further to the left. Uh, his wife, uh, I mean, it's beyond suspecting. Initially, she suspects. Uh, then she knows um, she's willing to take Ernest back, but Ernest decides to uh, divorce her and to marry Gellhorn. And they're married from uh, basically 1940 to 1944, formally divorced in, in 45. But they have a lot of adventures together. And one of them is to go to China basically for their honeymoon, and to report on the Sino-Japanese um, Sino war there. And, and Hemingway, Hemingway's a guy who, you know, he's not, he, he's not just a reporter. He, he, he starts out as a reporter, of course, but he's not just a reporter who has to w ask for, he's not like, like the, you know, you, you look at the, the White House uh, press briefings, and, you know, there's 20 or 30 reporters there, and they're all raising their hand uh, trying to get attention. Well, Ernest gets the the one on one. That's Madame Chiang Kai Shek there, um, and that's one side of of the Spanish uh, anti Japanese Spanish coalition. And the other side is, of course, the communists. And when Hemingway is there in Spain, uh, he is summoned to see Chow and Lai and hear um, hear the communist side of um, of the you know, their appreciation of the political situation at the time. 
Um, we don't know for sure that he also met with Mao, uh, who I think is one of the great villains in history. Um, but here looks like kind of a, uh, you know, he kind of looks kind of friendly and appealing and, and young. Um, but this picture is among Hemingway's private pictures. And so it uh, leads you to wonder whether Hemingway took it himself and if he met Mao as well as Chow when he was out there. So um, they're in, they're in uh, China for a few months. And then uh, the US gets into World War II. They go back to the Caribbean. Hemingway leaves his family and the home that we looked at initially in Key West and basically um, takes this lovely boat and moves it to, um, to Cuba. And she's still there, the Pilar. And uh, there, uh, Gellhorn rents a house that he eventually buys uh, called the Finca Vigia. And uh, Hemingway gets involved in another set of remarkable adventures uh, using this boat as a submarine hunter. So this is a boat that's uh, 38 feet long, uh, certainly less than five tons. And uh, Hemingway's idea is uh, with this boat, he's going to hunt these boats, uh, <laughs> which um, it's not quite as crazy as it sounds. Uh, they, you know, thank God they never got close enough. Um, but it does kind of make sense if you look at uh, this uh, map is a German map of uh, showing uh, various features in the in the Caribbean and Cuban waters, and there's Havana, right there. Uh, Florida is basically pointing at Havana, and Hemingway lives near Havana, and the the U-boats um, that's a natural channel for the U-boats to use to get uh, at, from the um, from the Atlantic to the Gulf of Mexico or down around to the Caribbean. So um, it's, a, it's not totally crazy to say that um, you, know, you should be on the lookout for German submarines there. Uh, it, it is stretching it a little to say that you're going to go beyond uh, just looking for German submarines. If you see one, you're going to try and fight it with your uh, little wooden boat. So um, more Hemingway adventure. But the war moves across the Atlantic to the other side, and Hemingway decides eventually that uh, he's got to go. Uh, Martha's been pressuring him. Uh, she says that the main event is going to be in Europe. And uh, Hemingway ultimately gives in and, and goes you know, just before D-Day. He gets to, uh, gets to England. He grew this beard uh, because, of the, because of a skin problem that he had uh, while he was patrolling for German submarines. Anyway, he becomes a correspondent. This is his uh, government ID as a correspondent. Uh, he's a little overweight at this point, uh, uh, 200, 220 pounds. There's a substantial paunch that he has for a few years. Um, and he has some remarkable adventures in, uh, while he's in Europe, which include um, one of the places that this is one of the milestones that I talked about earlier. And uh, here he does team up with OSS for a few days. This guy, the guy on the left there, I don't know if the, the Pointer's not working too well. But the guy on the left is David K.E. Bruce, who's the head of OSS in Europe. <clears throat> the guy in the middle is a, a French um, communist partisan uh, from a group that is allied to the group that Hemingway visited in Spain. I mean, there's a remarkable, these, these characters keep, you know, there, there are themes that recur in Hemingway's life, and that's one of them. Uh, and then there's also another theme that you can uh, you, you can see in this picture, and that's alcohol. Uh, Ernest is holding, a, if you look closely, you'll see he's holding a wine glass in his, in his right hand, and the gentleman on his right is holding a bottle, which he appears just to have poured into Hemingway's wine glass. So if you've got to go to war, um, France is a great place to go to war, especially if you can hang out with uh, interesting people like David K.E. Bruce and the, the French fighter there and be su supplied with French wine. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm kind of tired now after all of Ernest's adventures, but he's not. Um, one, of the the one of the themes in his life is the amount of energy uh, and, and sort of the, ma there's, there's, I'm not a psychiatrist, but there is sort of a manic, manic depressive wave that you see going through his life. And so he's, he's kind of on a manic stage now. And you know, as if three wives aren't enough, 
he's going to go for four. And uh, he meets Mary Welsh, who's another, who's a correspondent, who spent most of the war uh, in London and uh, falls in love with her, and she becomes his fourth wife. Okay, so what do they do after World War II? The Hemingways go back to uh, Cuba, and uh, Ernest starts to write um, war novels. He says he's writing the great war novel, um, part of which appears eventually uh, in slightly different form in The Old Man and the Sea. And then there are, uh, there's a book called Islands in the Stream, which is published posthumously. But what goes on in the United States after uh, World War II? Uh, it's the Red Scare, okay? Uh, here on the right, this lady is the, um, they called her the, the blonde spy queen. Um, she wasn't actually blonde, as you can see. Uh, she had um, dark hair. Uh, she's a Vassar graduate, and she's Jacob Golos's lover. And she was also his assistant in running Soviet cases in, <clears throat> in the United States. So um, she defects to the FBI. Um, that's a very interesting story in itself, why she did that. Um, part of it was that Golos had died, uh, and she didn't like the people the Soviets sent after that. Um, but anyway, she tells them everything she knows, and then she, uh, she writes her memoirs. Uh, they're serialized in McCall's, uh, and she testifies uh, up on the hill, um, you know, not, not too far from where we're standing right now, and this is one of those days. And she was a great, she was a great witness, by the way. Uh, she had a fabulous memory, and uh, the FBI was able to corroborate um, almost everything that she told them. Uh, and the FBI, she had a kind of a sad life after this, but the, the, she didn't have a great life before this either. And the reason she joined the party was what, and, and she had a social conscience, but also she was lonely and looking for companionship. <clears throat> so, but the, the FBI pretty much took care of her uh, for the rest of her life. So... Um, Part of what uh, I trace in the book is um, Hemingway, these, these um, allegations and uh, this information about Soviet intelligence is coming out. And even though he wasn't the greatest spy the Soviets ever recruited, he's got to be looking over his shoulder and wondering, you know, after Golos recruited him, uh, he and... Um, Bentley are living in uh, the village in New York. Can you imagine, say you recruit the, the, this great American author and you go back to your, uh, um, let's call her field wife, you go back to your field wife and uh, who's, who's, who's doing the same work, uh, you'd have to be amazingly disciplined not to say, you wouldn't believe who I just signed up. But apparently he was, he, you know, he, was a, he, was a, uh, he wasn't a perfect spy, uh, he wasn't really trained, but he had he had he was trained in the ways of the Bolshevik conspiratorial life, and and so it appears that he did not tell her uh, about Hemingway, and uh, she never said anything about Hemingway. But Hemingway had to wonder, you know, what, what is she going to are is that going to come out? And and he was already a little edgy about this kind of stuff because of. Um, uh, because he was considered a premature anti-fascist, because he had butted heads with the uh, FBI, and um, because there's a streak of paranoia running through his life, he, he's, he's already looking over his shoulder, uh, waiting for the IRS, the FBI, um, you know, some federal agency that's going to come after him. So uh, while he's in Cuba, um, you know, he could have lived in he could have lived in in somewhere in Florida, or he could have moved to Idaho early and had a less dramatic life. But what's going on in these years in Cuba? Uh, Castro is fighting the Batista regime, and uh, Hemingway is involved. We don't know all the details, uh, but we do know that he is basically a supporter of Castro, and he's a friend of Camilo Cienfuegos, who is the guy on uh, the right there. Uh, I, I would say the guy with the beard, but that, um, <laughs> that <laughs> describes a lot of them, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, so Hemingway is involved in, in this revolution in some way that we don't, you know, in, in, in an undetermined way, but um, he is in favor of it. So uh, who comes back into the story? It's this guy. It's, uh, it's Matthews. He was the guy with the tie. 
still wearing a tie, though this is probably, a, to be fair, this is a formal picture. Um, and he comes back, and this is the last scoop of his life. Uh, after the Spanish Civil War, uh, he went to New York, he became an editor, he was a little bored, he was looking for fulfillment. Uh, he had always been in love with the Spanish Republic, the anti-fascist cause, and he sees something similar in Castro as Castro is battling, um, <clears throat> battling Batista. And he comes down and he hangs out with Hemingway and together they refight the Spanish Civil War. They see the Cuban Revolution through the eyeglasses that they acquired during the Spanish Civil War. So uh, Matthews writes uh, three articles that appear over the fold in the New York Times uh, and they resuscitate Castro's revolution at a time when his uh, fortunes were down and the government, Batista government, was saying he was dead. And um, Matthew's story, Matthews goes down, goes down to Cuba, he hangs out in the forest with, um, with Castro, uh, smokes these awful cigars, and giant cigars, uh, huffing and puffing. And then, and, then, um, and then he writes the story, Castro is alive and that bec that's a sensation. It puts Castro back on the map. Castro might have gotten back on the map by himself. I, I, but uh, it, 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 uh, there was a, so there was a group of people who loved Matthews for this, and there was a group of people who said, um, you know, you've done a terrible thing, especially as Castro moves to the left. Uh, Castro, before the revolution, uh, always sidestepped the question of whether or not he was a communist. He said, I believe in humanism and democracy. Are you a communist? Mm, my brother is. Are you a communist? My brother's a communist. I believe in humanism and democracy. So, um, you know, I, I don't know, um, pay your money and take your choice. Was he a, was he a secret communist who uh, was unveiled later on or did he move to the left politically over time? Um, so all this kind of wears Hemingway out. That's. Um, not just my finding, but uh, I think any Hemingway biographer would tell you this. And uh, Hemingway winds up uh, around, this is at the time of his 60th birthday, uh, and he's just the, all the pressures that have built up in his life uh, are uh, coming home to roost, and, and he is uh, demonstrably slowing down. Um, the argument in my book is the pressure that hasn't really been adequately appreciated up to now is the political pressure that, um, you know, that, that his dalliance with the Soviets, his uh, support for Castro, and then uh, the Bay of Pigs uh, comes in April 1961. Uh, Hemingway always wanted to have it both ways. He wanted to be able to keep his uh, place in Cuba, which he'd had by that time uh, for about 20 years, his friends, that was his home. Um, <clears throat> And uh, he also wanted to stay a loyal American citizen. So, uh, but after the Bay of Pigs, it's impossible, and he realizes that. And if you, if you look at uh, Hemingway's suicide attempts, you see uh, that right after the Bay of Pigs, he um, makes a, a serious suicide attempt, and then he makes two or three more, and then uh, ultimately winds up killing himself in, um, <clears throat> in the summer of 1961. Uh, and then, uh, then there's a, so Hemingway scholarship starts, poor Hemingway, he's, he's barely dead in the grave, but Hemingway scholarship starts right away. And the biggest, one of the biggest um, uh, issues is whether he committed suicide. His wife said he did not commit suicide, that he, he, it was an accident uh, when he was cleaning his guns. But this guy, who uh, he, a guy named Emmett Watson, uh, who is Hemingway's kind of reporter, he's a, he's a uh, he's, uh, works for the uh, Seattle Post Intelligencer, and he's the guy who used to cover the docks and baseball, and and you know the the uh, he worked as a longshoreman. Um, <clears throat> he drank coffee, smoked three or four packs of cigarettes, and uh, had a drink or two. And uh, he's the he's he's again the kind of guy that weaves in and out of this story, and I think makes it so interesting. Uh, he got the story uh, on Hemingway and Castro, and and um, Hemingway opened up. In uh, earlier in uh, after Castro seized power uh, and got the whole story, and then after uh, Hemingway dies, uh, he he goes to um, goes to Idaho uh, 
and he does what he does best. Instead of going to research, instead of going and asking for interviews with the big guys, with the Hemingway family, or the you know the the the, um, the main citizens of the town, he goes and he interviews the the barkeep, the 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 doorman, uh, the guy who uh, who works in the um, you know who works for the funeral home, and uh, he gets the story, and he's the first one to bring bring the story that Hemingway's death was a suicide. Anyway, so that's the that's the that's the, the rough outlines of the story, uh, and at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Mm. Yes, sir. And, yeah, and then I, I, yeah, if you would be so kind as to go to the, uh, the microphones for your questions. I just finished your book last night. It's absolutely fascinating uh, for someone who's read about uh, Hemingway, uh, who's uh, visited uh, uh, the home in Havana and the home in Key West. Uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, I was uh, on the staff of the Senate Intelligence Committee for a good many years, uh -huh. <laughs> back to the Church Committee, yeah. uh, handling oversight of the FBI. I really got two questions. First is, uh, when uh, he was recruited, uh, was that period, 4041, of the Nazi-Soviet pact. Yes. How could Hemingway, as a leftist, have been attracted to uh, the pitch at a, at a period like that when so many were falling away from the party okay. uh, since Stalin had, uh, uh -huh. had uh, essentially uh, uh, signed up to let, uh, uh, let Hitler have his way? Yeah, his, his timing was awful. Um, so, um, you know, up until the time of the, the pact, uh, the Hitler-Stalin pact, um, Molotov-Ribbentrop, Nazi-Soviet, it's all the same pact. Uh, and in, in, in September, um, or is it August? It's actually August. In August 1939, uh, the Soviets and the, and the, the Nazis uh, signed a, a non-aggression pact. Uh, so they're, they're basically sort of allies. Um, and his argument was, Stalin needed a breathing, you got himself some breathing space there. So he viewed it as a tactical, uh, a tactical move by Stalin and forgave him. But as you point out, uh, he wa that was a lonely position to take because um, you know, so many left uh, leaning and communist Americans said, that's it, I'm out of here. Uh, the other question has to do with uh, his uh, view that the FBI was all over. When you read other biographers, uh, there's even more detail as to his, uh, his uh, thought. And there was one biographer who sort of bought into this idea. And uh, what were your findings about the FBI surveillance of, uh, so, of Hemingway? So um, I say it didn't happen. Um, and and the, the, uh, the Hemingway's FBI file is about 120, 130 pages. Uh, and what that file is mostly about is Cuba and when Hemingway was involved with the embassy and basically poaching on FBI turf there, running counterintelligence operations against suspected fascists. That's what most of the file's about. The rest of the file is kind of uh, like a clipping file. Um, somebody saw something interesting about Hemingway, oftentimes it's a newspaper article, they pop it in there. Or somebody ran into Hemingway on a social circuit, sent a report in. It's not a surveillance file. There, and there, so the, the, you know, if, there's a, if they were surveilling Hemingway, that file would be hundreds of pages long. Like Joris Ivans, who was a Dutch communist that, that Hemingway knew, uh, Ivans' file is, is five, six, seven times uh, Hemingway size. Um, so um, basically, they were not, they did not have an investigation open. As, as you know, that's a term of art for the FBI. Inve if, if the FBI has an investigation open, they are working towards, a, they're trying to build a case and see if they can take it to court. This is kind of like, um, you know, this is, this is J. Edgar Hoover's reading file. It's to kind of, kind of keep him up to date on, on what's going on with Hemingway. What he didn't like, what Hoover didn't like about Hemingway was the thought that Hemingway might write something bad about, <laughs> the, um, about the FBI. And that was, a, that was a main concern for Hoover 
uh, as he built up the FBI and protected its reputation. So that's, that's the block that he was in. So I'm out on a, I'm, I'm a little in, among, if you consider me a Hemingway scholar, I'm, I am kind of on a limb here because um, everybody else goes, or, well, not, almost everybody else goes the other way. Uh, Hotchner especially, who was a Hemingway uh, biographer and uh, a Hemingway associate for a number of years. Hotchner's still alive, by the way. He's about 100, 102, 103. Um, told me he was not interested in talking to me. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'm from the Caribbean, uh -huh. so I'm from a very small island, St. Martin. But I have two questions. Um, the first question would be, you didn't touch on this, how do you see all of this spying or involved in all of these different activities, right? Um, influences writing. Is, is, is his works, right? Okay. I mean, uh, uh, do you see that? Do you see elements of that in, in his work? That's the first question. And the second question is a much more, and I have a problem remembering the name. At the very late 1950s, beginning of the 1960s, a group of American intellectuals, writers, artists, et cetera, get to, got together and created an organization. I forgot the name of the organization. To, in essence, to give a different view of the Cuban Revolution in America. Right, as it became more and more seen as you know, radicalizing and moving the different direction. Um, did Hemingway play any role? I, I, I'm sorry that I don't have the name of the organization, but did Hemingway play any role in that since you say he was playing off both sides? And uh, did he remain over time sympathetic to the revolution or did he become increasingly um, like most, you know, sat in a, a lot of different yeah. people became increasingly um, kind of alienated from the revolution in the hope that this was going to be a new way of uh, doing things okay. and relating with America. Thank so, you very much. So um, three questions. Um, the first question is how is this story reflected in Hemingway's work or what's the relationship between the two? Hemingway wrote one book that is frankly about uh, intelligence and it's about counterintelligence during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and he casts himself as this, um, as the as the hero of that. Uh, and to me, what he shows in that book is uh, he was involved in some way, day to day work of counterintelligence in the Spanish Civil War. That's really the only um, sort of classical espionage uh, in his work. In Islands in the Stream, he talks about um, his his work against the uh, looking for German submarines. Um, and I also advance the argument that Hemingway's, uh, w the, what, what Hemingway writes after World War II is a lot less political than what he wrote before World War II. So uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls is, to me, one of the great novels of the 20th century, and it's a call to arms. It says, hey, get your gun, go out and fight fascism. Uh, and uh, what he writes after World War II is fishing, hunting in Africa, bullfighting, and uh, Paris. Then he writes a couple of, of, of novels that are published after his death. But that, those are what he publishes in the 50s. And that is, um, you know, at least you can make the argument that's not a real political, that's not a political statement um, by and large. So the third question was about him and, uh, and Castro and the American group. I do not know uh, of that group. Um, I, he, he, Hemingway played a role in preparing Castro for his first visit to the United States, which was in uh, April 1959. He basically prepped him for, for, uh, to meet for press conferences uh, here in the United States. Uh, and then as Castro moved to the left and became increasingly anti-American, uh, Hemingway became more uncomfortable. Uh, his position, he thought his position was untenable. He always, but up, up until he died, he always had a soft spot for the Cuban Revolution. So uh, what I like to say is Hemingway, Hemingway is not like the, the, the guy down at the State Department who's telling you what the policy is, right? Uh, the, the, the spokesman of the, for the State Department or somebody who who, who writes a, a, <clears throat> a well-reasoned foreign policy position. He is, uh, 
he's basically a novelist. He's an artist, and he has political attitudes and sympathies. So, um, you know, I, I, that's the way I look at his his view of of Cuba and the revolution. I wanted to touch base on one of the themes you mentioned. Some of the pictures, of him holding a glass, and I don't know how much of a boozer he was, but. At his home in Key West, he has a urinal that he, I guess, ripped out of a bar that stated that uh, was used for a, a cat uh, water fountain afterwards. From that perspective, when people say he looks like a good guy to, to recruit, uh, he drinks a lot, knows a lot of people, hangs out with these crowds, um, there's a double-edged sword to that in regards to how well he is a strategic uh, person that to uh, asked the right questions while keeping his mouth shut. W what is your interpretation of why they said, let's, let's recruit Hemingway? Uh, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, there's a couple ways to answer that. And, and one would be from the point of view from a, a, of a targeter for an intelligence organization. You know, do you want to hire the guy who drinks too much no matter what he brings to the table? Um, and the, there's a, I, in, in the book I go into uh, the unofficial application, his unofficial application to OSS, which was basically put forward by, by Martha, and OSS staffs it, and they basically come to the conclusion that, hey, we can't control this guy, uh, he's too independent, he's too left-leaning. They don't mention his drinking, but that's, you know, that, that's kind of understood there. Hoover mentions that. Hoover says, hey, you know, if I were running an intelligence agency, I certainly wouldn't pick Ernest Hemingway on account of the drinking. What about the Soviets? Uh, first of all, I, I think um, I would. I, I don't have the Soviet staffing paper saying, um, you know, here's our policy on on, on agents who drink. Um, but I think you'd find among the Soviets a much greater tolerance for um, just uh, incredible amounts of drinking. Uh, and uh, Hemingway could also be uh, very disciplined. So yes, there was a drinking side. Um, I think a medical doctor would say he he had he was an alcoholic. Um, but he was also very disciplined, and he, he remained a disciplined writer until the end of his life. Um, he, he, he went to the, you know, they say, if you want to be a successful writer, the first thing you got to do is sit in the chair. Uh, you have to have a, a, a routine. And Hemingway, Hemingway did that pretty much till the end of his life. So he would bring that kind of discipline to an intelligence relationship. Um, and and uh, you know, a friend of mine who, who, who worked for the agency who read the recruitment chapter, chapter five in my book, yeah, initially I wasn't so sure. You know, I was like, ah, did, he, did he know, did he understand? And he read the, he read the raw material and, and what I wrote, and he said he absolutely understood. He knew exactly what was on the table here. So um, <clears throat> you know, I think he had the discipline to um, <clears throat> have a, a, a relation, a agent uh, an agent relationship with the Soviets. The last thing I would I would say is maybe the Soviets, maybe the, you know, if so so you're you're an intelligence agency, you got all these ops leads, right? So you you know you got twenty or thirty ops leads in your New York file, and yeah, you just keep working them, and and maybe one of them pans out, right? It's sort of like selling houses or cars or whatever, and and um, you know you 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 ask thirty people, and you get you you sell two or three. And so um, they might have been surprised when Hemingway said yes. They were going to ask him, sure, why not? Uh, and, and, um, and, then, and then he says yes. And then it's kind of like, and you see in the Soviet file a little bit of, well, what are we going to do now? Um, <laughs> so um, they, they didn't really have a specific tasking in mind for him initially. So, uh, and they're, they're kind of playing catch up ball. Uh, that's my reading of the file. They, they're playing catch up ball from, from then on. Anybody else? Just gonna let me go. Anyway, want to say thank you very much for hearing me out. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget, there's a book signing one level up in the bookstore. We'll see you there in just a couple minutes. <laughs>